Friday, and it will be like before, so I want you to sit every other one, and so number one being here, and then every other one over, number one being here, and then every other one over. So if you count, and you see that someone is sitting in two, don't move to four. They'll have to move, right? Okay? So make sure you sit in the odd-numbered seats, and then you'll be okay. And then over here, same thing, starts and then moves over. And the same is true up there, so that, that'll align with everything down here, okay? Uh, the sooner we get to see you, the sooner we can get started, and that's uh, important. Um, let's see, the material that uh, we will have on the exam will be everything I covered through Monday. And on Monday, I showed this slide, but I only talked through this one right here. So I'll talk about these reactions down here today. You're not responsible for those on the reaction, but you are responsible for this one up here. Okay. So only the things that I talked through on, um, on, on um, Monday. Okay, and at, uh, I did the review session last night. I have posted the review session online. You can take a look at that if you weren't able to make it and you'd like to see that. Um, you'll notice on the review session that I say that I'm taking questions. So I do this sometimes with students. If you would like to submit a question for me to put on the exam or to consider putting on the exam, I would be happy to do that. I will take one student question and put it on the exam. So send me your favorite question, send me what you would like me to put on there, and I will uh, think about that and pick one student question to put on there, okay? You need to have me that by tonight, okay? So if you get that to me by tonight, when I finish writing the exam, I'll make sure that one student question is on the exam. Uh, there was a question about, well, did we sing loud enough for the um, extra credit, and the answer is, Basically, you did, yeah. So but we'll, if there's any doubt, we're going to sing again today. So maybe, maybe if you know, that would help maybe just make sure there's going to be some extra credit or something, that would be good. Okay? Now, uh, so what I'm going to do today is actually kind of abbreviated. So I'm going to talk through uh, some more of the glycolysis. I'm going to talk about some consideration like other sugars that enter and some health considerations relative to that. And then I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions if you want to ask questions. So if you weren't able to come to the review session last night and you would like to ask questions <coughs> excuse me, here today, I'll be happy to answer questions for you. And if you want to leave, that's fine too. So whatever works for you. Clear as mud? Yes, sir. So his question has to do with the 10 steps of glycolysis, and that's what I was talking about here. This is step number eight. That's where I've stopped. Okay. okay. So I'm not holding you responsible for steps nine and 10. Even though you did give us the steps. Yeah, but I didn't talk about them. So, yeah. So, uh, Connie? So question. You said you need to know figures that are easy to remember, and you mentioned the first four of glycolysis. Yeah. And then you said, oh, I might add some more figures. Yeah. Uh, to go along, but you never did. I never did. Would you like me to add some more? Okay, then I won't. <laughs> How's that? So the, the variations of glucose and glucose pretty much. So what I'm going to hold you responsible for knowing the structures of in glycolysis for this exam will be the various structures of glucose and fructose. Yeah. Okay. Glucose and fructose molecules, like glucose 6 phosphate, yeah. fructose 6 phosphate, etc. Okay? So we'll keep it simple. So uh, people last night said that they felt that the uh, material is greater than the material in the first exam. Is that, was that the general consensus in the room? Yeah, yeah. Really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's always weird. I never had that perspective. So I think, oh, okay. Well, so, but then I guess I look at it differently than you do too, so that's fine. So uh, the format of the exam will be exactly as the first exam. Points may be slightly different for each section, but you'll have a short answer section, you'll have a problem solving section, and you'll have a longer answer section. So all three of those sections will be there. And I don't think time should be an issue. I try to keep it like I kept the last exam where hopefully time was not an issue. Yeah? Um, well, since I haven't written the exam yet, I'm not sure. Um, I, it's not going to be significantly different from what it was before. So, I mean, it might be a few points here or there, but I really don't think it's going to be, not think, I know it's not going to be significantly different. I've written about three quarters of the exam, so I, I know pretty much what's there. So, yeah. Yeah? Are you willing to post the curve from the last exam online anymore? I did. Oh, it is? Yeah. I'll go look at it. So it's on the, on the schedule page. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and after, oh, oh, I, that reminds me of one other thing with respect to grading. The TAs have a big issue with being able to grade it during uh, next week. So it means they've got two monster exams and they're not going to be able to have it graded before Thanksgiving. So I really wish we didn't have that happen, but there's not really a way that we have around that. Um, so they've got a biophysics and a biochemistry exam both next week and they're not done with those until Wednesday. So there's no way to have the exam graded. So you can go home and have Thanksgiving and you won't hopefully think too much about your grade. You come back. I can assure you we will have the exams ready for you when you come back on Monday. But um, the exams will not be available next week, unfortunately. Okay? Yes, sir? Previous exams that were resubmitted for rescoring, yeah. are those available in the office now? So uh, previous exams where people uh, asked, uh, had regrading requests, those are all back in the BB office. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, let's get into this material. So. Um, I talked last time about this interesting enzyme, phosphoglycerate mutase, and I pointed out to you that a mutase um, has this odd system of operation where it adds a second phosphate and then it takes off the, 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 the phosphate that was on there originally. And as a result of that, there's an intermediate that has two phosphates, and that's how we get uh, 2,3-BPG. Um, so that's a really cool and interesting reaction. Uh, one of the reasons that that rearrangement of the phosphate is being made is to essentially create a high energy phosphate. And that's what happens in the next step of glycolysis. The next step is catalyzed by the enzyme known as enolase. And enolase catalyzes the removal of water. Okay? So water is taken out of this guy right here. That creates a double bond next to this phosphate. And this phosphate is next to this carboxyl group. Phosphoenyl pyruvate, which you can abbreviate PEP, okay? And PEP has a lot of energy, and PEP means a lot of energy, and PEP has a lot of energy. PEP is one of the highest energy molecules uh, that you will find in your body, okay? Very high energy, and we recall of the earlier example that I talked about in glycolysis where we have a, a molecule that has a very high energy, and it has a phosphate on it, it can transfer that phosphate to ADP and make ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in the last step. Okay? In the last step, we see this high energy phosphate being transferred directly onto ADP to make ATP, and that yields pyruvate. Now, this last step is a really interesting step. It's the step I like to refer to as the Big Bang. The Big Bang. Why do I call it the Big Bang? Well, this reaction right here has a very large negative delta G zero prime. Very large negative delta G zero prime. Now, notice that ATP is being made, and in spite of that, it still has a large negative delta G zero prime. There's almost enough energy in this molecule to make two ATPs. There's almost enough energy in this molecule to do that. That's why I call it the Big Bang, because when this sucker explodes, it makes ATP, and there's all this excess energy. What happens when we have excess energy? Yeah? Is that the metabolism of heat? Are, you're getting ahead of me, so let me... <laughs> yes, okay. So we have all this excess energy, and um, we're not making ATP, okay? Well, what happens when we have excess energy in any reaction? Well, that energy is just lost. And when we lose energy, we lose it as heat. This Big Bang reaction gives off a lot of heat. Okay? So one of the reasons that we get hot when we exercise is we're going through a lot of glycolysis, and we're going through a lot of this reaction, and we're generating a lot of excess heat on the side. So the reason we get hot is we're just not 100% efficient at making ATP. That excess energy is given off as heat, and that's why we sweat and get hot um, whenever we're exercising. Okay. Now, pyruvate kinase, um, I'll say a little bit more about in, uh, in a little bit. Now, that may not happen actually until Monday. But pyruvate kinase is, now this is very odd for glycolysis. Pyruvate kinase is the third enzyme that's regulated. Whoa. This is the only metabolic pathway that I know of where the last step 
is regulated. And it's actually regulated both allosterically and by covalent modification. Okay? It's very odd. Okay? Now, there's a reason why, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you the reason today because it's not going to make any sense to you, but it makes sense when we look at the reversal of this pathway. The reversal of this pathway involves the synthesis of glucose, and the synthesis of glucose is called gluconeogenesis, and it uses many of the steps of glycolysis. It doesn't use this step, but it uses many steps of glycolysis. Okay? It's important for the cell to be able to turn this enzyme on and off. If we think about it, we've got a very, very large delta G0 prime. If I can't turn this enzyme off, what's going to happen whenever I've got PEP? It's, it's going to go almost completely to, uh, to pyruvate. Almost completely to pyruvate. There may be times we don't want that happening. So the short answer to the reason we want to regulate this enzyme is because of the large delta G zero prime. Okay? We really want to be able to regulate that enzyme. So the three enzymes in glycolysis that are regulated are hexokinase. I said I won't say too much about that one. Phosphofructokinase, which turns out to be the most important one for the most part. And pyruvate kinase. Not surprisingly, all three of those reactions have a fairly negative delta G zero prime. Now, glycolysis, as I said, is unusual in being regulated at three places. And again, there are reasons why that's happening. But as you can see with this example, being able to turn off a reaction that has a large negative delta G0 prime, excuse me, is important for the cell. And that's part of the reason why the cell has, the, uh, has those three uh, different enzymes that are, that are regulated. OK, questions about that? Yes? glycolysis process, is there any sort of a storage or, I guess, battery area for the PEP? Is there a place to, to keep PEP? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is it somewhere where it's stored until PEP would need to be converted? Yeah. yeah. Um, they, that's actually a very good question. So his question is, is there, does the cell store PEP around? Uh, to my knowledge, it does not. Okay. Um, when we look at the metabolic pathways involved here, we see that PEP goes to here. And if we go backwards to um, the synthesis of, of, of glucose, then PEP is, is, is driven that way. So um, I don't know if stores are sitting around as such. Comment? Uh, what did you say were the two ways that pyruvate kinase is regulated? Kine pyruvate kinase is regulated both allosterically and by covalent modification. And I'll, and I'll talk more about those when I talk about regulation. Back here. Uh, you um, the three enzymes? Yes. The three enzymes regulated in glycolysis are hexokinase, PFK, which is also known as phosphofructokinase, and pyruvate kinase. Those are the three regulated enzymes in glycolysis. And to come back to your question, I just as I'm thinking through my head about this, there are a couple of reactions where um, the phosphate of PEP is donated to something. So PEP in, in a couple of reactions, they're not major reactions, but in a couple of reactions, PEP serves as a high energy phosphate source, kind of like ATP does, but they're not, they're not central reactions. Smaller things like PEP. Small, yeah, yep. Okay, all right, so that's what's up with that. Now, we need to, uh, there's the overall summary, blah, 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 no, you're not going to memorize that. Um, we do need to consider some things about glycolysis that are really important, though. Okay? And it's one that I've sort of glossed over, but I want to come back and visit right now. Okay? And that's a phenomenon known as redox balancing. Redox balancing. It's the first time you've heard that uh, expression. What in the world is up with redox balancing? Okay? Well, redox, of course, refers to reduction oxidation. Reduction oxidation. Right? And when I'm talking about balancing, I'm not talking about the fact that Every reduction gives an oxidation, and every oxidation gives a reduction. That's not what I'm talking about. So the balancing is something different from that. Okay? When I'm talking about redox balancing, I'm talking about the fact that cells have a limited number of electron carriers. 
cells have a limited number of electron carriers. So, so far we've been saying, okay, well here's this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate reaction. It gets oxidized to form 3-phosphoglycerate. I'm sorry, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And um, NADH is produced. And we didn't think anything more about it. But what I'm telling you now is that cells have a limited amount of NAD. Cells have a limited amount of NAD. When there's plenty of oxygen in our cells, the NADH that's made goes and dumps off the electrons in the electron transport system and becomes NAD again. Okay? I'll repeat that because that's a very important point. When there's abundant oxygen in our cells, the NADH that's produced in oxidation reactions dumps its electrons into the electron transport system and becomes NAD again. As long as we have plenty of oxygen, we don't have to worry about balancing because we're automatically grabbing the electrons here, going over here, and dumping them, and then coming back as an NAD again. Okay? We have to think about balancing when we don't have sufficient oxygen. We have to think about balancing when we don't have sufficient oxygen. And that's what you see depicted on the screen here. If I don't have sufficient oxygen, then NADH that's made here cannot dump its electrons into the electron transport system. We'll talk about that as a very important consideration next term. But suffice it to say that in the absence of oxygen, if we don't do something with that NADH, it's going to accumulate and we're not going to have any NAD left. If we don't have any NAD left, what's going to happen to that reaction? It ain't going to go. We got trouble. Okay. Well, glycolysis is such an important pathway for the cell because it makes all kinds of useful things that we really, don't, we really can't afford to have that pathway plugged up. But I've told you that there are times that cells run out of oxygen and they have to be able to adapt to that. So they've adapted a mechanism that uh, you see here, where the NADH, instead of dumping off its electrons to the electron transport system, dumps its electrons onto pyruvate. When it dumps its electrons onto pyruvate, okay, a couple of things can happen. If you're a bacterial or bacterium or a yeast cell, that's the reason, that's what fermentation is all about. That's what they're making is ethanol. Notice that the byproduct of that is more NAD. And that NAD now can be reused back up here. We've just balanced the equation. So we've balanced it. We've, we've regenerated the NAD that we need, and we didn't even have to have oxygen for it. That's why making beer, making wine, is occurring in an environment where there's no oxygen. Because they, the, the cell has to do what it can, and so it starts making ethanol, and at the same time making NAD that it can use to keep this process going. Okay, so her, her question is, isn't ethanol bad for cells? I'm talking about yeast and bacteria here first. Okay? We do something different. Right? But yeast and bacteria also don't like this too much. Okay? You can get up to maybe 12 to 15% ethanol before they conk out. Okay? The reason we distill liquor Okay, we distill the alcohol in liquor is because we, the yeast and bacteria can't make it at a high enough concentration. They die by the time they get to that point. Okay? They use, they use a still to pull out the ethanol and then make vodka and all the various things that are there. Okay? So the bacteria and yeast don't like it either, but they tolerate a lot more than we do. We don't make ethanol. I'm going to show you something about that in just a second. Instead, we convert pyruvate into lactate. So when I showed you that three fates earlier, of pyruvate, I said one was it could go to acetyl-CoA if we had oxygen. I said it could go to ethanol if you're a bacterium or a yeast. The third thing is it can go to lactate if you're an animal. Lactate is known as lactic acid. Some people like to think that because when you exercise heavily, excess lactic acid is produced, and that's what leads to sore muscles. Other people dispute that, so whether that's true or not, I won't try to, to wade into that argument. But suffice it to say that lactic acid is a byproduct of heavy exercise because your muscles are using energy faster than oxygen can come to them. So they've got to make something to keep that glycolysis process going. Okay, questions about that? Yes, sir? Besides just 
choking down the reaction with not having any NAD plus left over as an electron acceptor, yep. if that actually occurred, would that be the major consideration? Or is it the fact that you also have NADH that's in excess and runs around willy-nilly reducing stuff in the cell? So his question is, are there other considerations besides the fact that you run out of NAD here? Can the NADH dump its electrons to other things? And the answer is basically not, no. So what will happen is NADH will just accumulate, but nothing else will happen. Now, keep in mind that I describe this as running out of NAD, right? But remember that NADH is a, is a product, and NAD is a substrate, right? So we can imagine that if we let that NADH get even a little bit too high, we're going to favor the backwards reaction. So that's the bigger consideration uh, with respect to NADH, all right? So we get too much NADH. Even if we haven't used all of the NAD, that reaction isn't going to go forward for very long because the product is going to be accumulating and the delta G is going to become positive. Okay? Yes? You mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, I believe, that uh, when you're doing these conditions that lots of the electrons, like the cell uses NAD to get rid of those excess electrons in these conditions. Reaction C affects or more than normal amount of electrons escape in. So to speak. I'm not sure I understand your question. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility of some of the electrons not being picked up and going around causing problems like we talked about before? So, okay, so his question is if you run out of, uh, well, if you run out of NAD, the question is do the electrons go somewhere else or do they cause problems, okay? Um, I would say no, okay? So you're basically going to stop the reaction when you start tipping the balance of products and reactants. That's really what's going to determine what's, whether or not that reaction is going to go forward. Okay? Okay. Um, let's see. Now, I wanted to say just a word about uh, what happens inside um, of us. And um, this is always something that's of interest to students. Uh, here's the same thing I, on the screen that I showed you schematically on the last figure. Okay? And we see, uh, again, the same sort of phenomenon. We see that NADH is produced by this oxidation reaction. Over here, it gets used, again, when we're out of oxygen to make, remake NAD and we're back here. This again depicts what happens inside of um, bacteria and yeast. You don't see lactate on there, right? Okay. Now I'll tell you something that will surprise you. We have in our bodies abundant alcohol dehydrogenase. Why don't we make ethanol? Wouldn't that be a real cheap Friday night? Right? Just hold your breath, right? And you'd have you start producing this stuff, right? Well, it turns out that we don't have this. This process actually takes this reaction right here, okay? Um, and this enzyme we don't have, okay? At least the enzyme that produces acetaldehyde. We have an enzyme that, that, that produces a related compound, but we don't have the enzyme that produces acetaldehyde. So why do we have alcohol dehydrogenase? Any ideas? Yeah. So we, his, his answer, he says that, well, you're breaking down ethanol. And the answer is basically yes. Okay? Ethanol, as we've described, is not very compatible with our cells, right? Even if no matter how much of the stuff we drink, our body is actually detoxifying or trying to detoxify ethanol with this enzyme. And it's running the reaction backwards to acetaldehyde. The problem? Oh, just the minor problem that acetaldehyde causes hangovers. Yeah, so if you wonder why you get a hangover, you can blame that enzyme, okay? Make sense? Now, at this point, somebody always says, now let's see. If I go and exercise real heavily and my oxygen is low, what's going to happen? Oh, okay, there's all kinds of schemes with that, so I'm not going to go into that. The thought of running heavily after you've drunk a bunch of beer just doesn't sound like a very fun idea to me. You know? What? Isn't acetaldehyde more toxic than ethanol naturally? Um, acetaldehyde's fairly nasty. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Okay, uh, let's see. Where were we? So there's, uh, there's our pyruvate fates again. I remind you of what I showed you earlier. Pyruvate going now to acetaldehyde and ethanol. That's happening in bacteria yeast. Lactate happens inside of us. 
acetyl-CoA. If oxygen is available in any of these cells, uh, assuming they're all aerobic, like some, you know, most bacteria are aerobic as well. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about this reaction actually right here uh, at the beginning of next term. Okay, um, where am I at? Ethanol formation, there you go. Blah, we don't need to do that. Lactate formation. Uh, that reaction uh, is, again, one that we have. We have the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. You notice the difference in this reaction compared to what's happening in bacteria and yeast is in bacteria and yeast, we're going from a three-carbon compound to a two-carbon compound. In us, we're making lactic acid. And lactic acid turns out to be pretty much a biological dead end. We don't really convert lactate into anything else. Well, then what happens when it accumulates? Well, when it accumulates... We've got a whole bunch of lactic acid sitting over here, and it's not very useful for us. Our body has to wait until we catch up in the oxygen department, and then it runs the reaction backwards to make pyruvate. And it turns out that this cycle actually is very important uh, when we're exercising heavily. Our body has a very cool way of dealing with lactate, okay? uh, where parts of our body have oxygen and other parts don't. And I'll explain that to you next term. Okay, um, let's see. What else did I want to say here? Pathogenic obligate anaerobes, don't want to talk about that. Fermentation options, uh, don't want to talk about that. And next I'll talk about other sugars, and then I'll finish uh, for today, and then I'll open it up to questions. So, blah. All right. Now, glycolysis is a central metabolic pathway. That central metabolic pathway um, is central to most cells on the face of the earth. Almost every cell on the face of the earth has it. And it's useful because it allows us to oxidize not only glucose, but it allows other sugars to enter that pathway as well. Okay? So, for example, there are enzymes that will, through a series of steps, convert galactose into glucose 6-phosphate. And that turns out to be very useful because when we drink milk, we're getting a lot of galactose. Milk contains lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide that contains both glucose and galactose. So we have to be able, ideally, to uh, convert galactose into something that's useful for us, and we do that in a, in a process I'll show you in just a second. Fructose, not surprisingly, is something that we uh, can convert into fructose 6-phosphate and metabolize inside of glycolysis. And if I have time, I will tell you briefly why I think we have an epidemic of obesity relative to fructose. Okay. Um, in fact, I'll start there. This is... I'm going to give you Kevin Ahern's pet theory about why America is growing fatter and fatter and fatter. Okay? Now, this is Kevin Ahern's pet theory. There's no evidence for this theory, okay? <laughs> other than what I'm going to argue for you on the screen. But I think it's not an illogical argument. Right? One of the things that's happened in the American diet over the past 20 or 30 years has been a, uh, the a, a increasing use of fructose inside of... Um, materials for sweetening. We talk about it as high fructose corn syrup. Okay? The American obesity epidemic, um, you can literally trace to about the time we started putting that into um, our um, food. Okay? So, high fructose. We've got high fructose. Well, fructose is just a sugar. We just oxidize it like glucose. We've got the glycolysis pathway. What's the deal? Well, I'm going to argue with you here that there is a big deal. The big deal is what you see on the screen. The last pathway didn't show you what you see here. The last pathway showed you fructose going to fructose 6-phosphate and then on into glycolysis. I argue that if that pathway occurs, not a big deal. I also argue that if we overload that pathway, okay, that this pathway causes some problems. Okay? Now, let's think about this. Here's fructose. First, I need to tell you what's happening in this pathway. Fructose, we've got a lot of fructose in our body, right? A lot of fructose floating around here. There's an enzyme called fructokinase that will convert fructose into fructose 1-phosphate, okay? Then there's this enzyme called fructose 1-phosphate aldolase. And then notice the aldolase is kind of like the aldolase we saw in glycolysis. It splits this 6-carbon molecule into two 3-carbon molecules. One is glyceraldehyde and one is DHAP. That's the same as we saw in glycolysis. And we say, oh, glyceraldehyde, that's the problem. Well, no, we can convert glyceraldehyde into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So at this point, we have two things exactly the same as glycolysis. 
Why are we obese? There's something very important we've neglected. Anybody know what it is? We've talked about it. I'll give you a hint. That last pathway showed going in through fructose 6-phosphate. This is not going in through fructose 6-phosphate. Yeah. I'm sorry? Well, no, it's not that. It's not, not, not the absence of phosphates, no. Okay, I'll tell you the answer. The answer, at least from Kevin Ahern's pet theory of why Americans, Americans are getting obese, that's a good acronym, right? My pet theory about this, okay, is that we have just bypassed the phosphofructokinase step. Phosphofructokinase was a regulatory enzyme, right? We've bypassed the regulatory enzyme, and now what are we doing? We're force-feeding the cell with these compounds, and when we start force-feeding the cell with these compounds, we're going to start force-feeding glycolysis all the way through. We start making lots of pyruvate. Pyruvate is a precursor of acetyl-CoA, and we have a lot of energy, as we do when we have a lot of sugar. Acetyl-CoA is made into fatty acids. High fructose corn syrup, by this argument, the Kevin Ahern pet theory about why Americans are getting obese, okay? Say that really fast, right? That, by this idea, okay, we're force-feeding glycolysis and as a consequence, making fatty acids and making fat. Okay? For what that's worth. Clear as light? Questions, comments? It pays you to look and see if you have high fructose corn syrup in the food that you're eating. It's pretty hard to find stuff that doesn't have it. Yeah. So um, pyruvate is an end product of glycolysis. Pyruvate can be converted to acetyl-CoA. And when we have lots of energy, acetyl-CoA goes straight to fatty acids. Yes, sir? So this would be the same net effect you'd see with somebody that had a knockout mutation for PFK? Um, he says it'd be the same net effect you would see if you had someone with a knockout mutation for PFK. I think you probably had somebody who was dead if they had a knockout mutation for PFK. But yeah. Yeah. Would that be worse? <laughs> yes, sir. Say it again. Not this reaction. Oh, yeah, a lot of people are interested in high fructose corn syrup and the link to obesity. And there are some really suggestive things that there is, in fact, a link between the two. So is there anything looking at biochemical pathways? Oh, all these are used, yeah. So this is only my own pet theory. Yeah. yeah. What's that? Well, you say some people say that the, that the sky is made of green cheese. I mean, so you can't go on what some people say, right? You're bouncing. Oh, I'm bouncing. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I thought we might, instead of going into galactose, uh, do a song and call it a day, and then I'll take questions for stuff. Does that seem reasonable? I've got a song about glycolysis. It's a lot of fun. It's to the tune of these are a few of my favorite things. Okay? Here we go. Everybody sing, so... Aldehyde sugars are always aldoses, and if there's a ketone, we call them ketoses. Some will form structures in circular rings. Saccharides do some incredible things. Onto a glucose, we add a P to it. ATP energy ought to renew it. Quick rearranging creates F6P. Without requiring input energy At a high rate, at a phosphate With PFK, F16BP is made up this way So we can run and play da 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 <laughs> Sorry, okay. Aldolase breaks it and then it releases DHAP and a few G3 pieces these both turn into 1,3-BPG, adding electrons onto NAD. Phosphate plus ADP makes ATP, while giving cells what they need energy, making triphosphates a situation of substrate-level phosphorylation. 3-BPG, 2-BPG, lose a water, 
PEP gets a high energy state just to make pyruvate. All the glucose gets broken and bent. If there's no oxygen, cells must ferment. Pyruvate, lactate, our cells hit the wall. Some lucky yeast get to make ethanol. This is the end of your glucose song. Unless you goof up and get it all wrong. Break it, don't make it to yield ATP. You'll save yourselves from futility. All right. Excellent. We will definitely have an extra credit question on the exam. So um, if there are people who would like to ask questions or mini review session here, I'll be happy to take questions. I see a hand back there. Yes. Bah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> wow. Uh, as a matter of fact, as a matter, oh, hold on here, sorry. Uh, uh, let's see, where's my thing? Here, there we go. Um, I am happy to grant that request. How's that? Um, every. <laughs> Every year I get this request, and I, it looks like it's made it into my highlights and so forth. So let's uh, take a look at that pathway and come up with a name. I will let you guys name it. How about that? So let's think, um, hold on just a second now. Let's see. Insulin signaling right here. This is the name. Which is, you want this one or do you want this one? You want the green one? That's usually the one people want to rename. Okay. All right, what do you want to call the green one? How boring. <laughs> P3K? The green one. The green one? The what? The Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Can anybody beat the Hulk? The Hulk it is. <laughs> so for this exam, phosphonosatide, three kinase will be known as the Hulk. <laughs> OK. And you may also call it phosphonosatide three kinase. We will not count that against you, OK? But if you call it the Hulk outside this class, please don't <laughs> tell anybody where you got that name from. It didn't come from me, right? The Hulk. OK, are there other real questions? <laughs> Connie. Um, ribose, does it have an alpha and beta? Does ribose have an alpha and beta? Anything that has a Hayward structure will have an alpha and a beta. And you may notice I didn't mention Hayward structures in class. I did put them in the highlights. So you should know Hayworth means ring. Fisher structure means straight chain. Probably got that in organic chemistry, but I just forgot to mention it the day that I talked about those. Other questions? Yes? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so her question is a very common one that Karen is asking. So the question that she's asking is I talked about the catalytic triad being the active site, and then I talked about separate things like the S1 pocket and the oxyanion hole. Okay? So really, it's a very semantic argument we're talking about here. So you're, you're correct. These are all in essentially the same place. Okay? So I simply use the, the, the three um, amino acid side chains to describe the active site, because that's where the reaction is catalyzed. But you're right. The substrate will be held at the active site. And that substrate specifically is held in the S1 pocket. So all I care about is that you know that the S1 pocket is right there at the active site. Whether we call that part of the active site or not is just semantic argument. OK? That's a very common question. I can probably get that the most common question of, of, of the, um, that material um, from students. Yeah? I wanted to check something about SH2 domains. Yes, um, SH2 I domains. I think it says that both the Hulk and uh, IRS have SH2 domains. OK. And they're like both. 
that allows them both to recognize like uh, yep. phosphate. Uh, plus, yeah. So when you see portions of a protein recognizing uh, phosphotyrosines, they have SH2 domains. That's right. Okay, so they both do it. They both do, yeah. When you see something recognizing a phosphotyrosine, which is what these are recognizing, it usually involves an SH2 domain. Yeah. Other questions? We got 10 more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So her question is, where on the G protein does the uh, G protein interact with the beta adrenergic receptor, okay? So on the beta adrenergic receptor, you've got all three present that, that's there. So that interaction that's there is not precluded by the uh, covering of the beta and the gamma. The beta and the gamma, however, have to move away in order for the G protein to interact with um, the um, adenylate cyclase. So all three are present in the beta adrenergic, when it binds to the beta adrenergic receptor. The binding of GTP causes it to lose the, the, the beta and the gamma, which is what enables it then to go and, and bind with the, the adenylate cyclase. So there's no initial binding of the GTP to the other subunits, is there? There's no initial binding of the GTP to the other subunits. The other subunits, in fact, don't bind GTP at all. So it's only the alpha subunit that will bind GTP. Yes? So the book calls it PI3K? Yeah. Oh, why not? <laughs> PI3K, we've got phosphonosotide 3K. My key is going to be this long. The TAs are going to kill me. <laughs> OK? Yeah, I'll go ahead. That's fine. I'm sorry. So, yeah. What are your TAs going to think when, you, when the Hulk is an acceptable answer? You know, one year, I, every year I rename that enzyme. One year we called it Larry. One, <laughs> last year I think we called it Malcolm. OK? <laughs> The Hulk is the best name we've had, though, I have to say. And so one year, I forgot to tell the TAs that I had done this. <laughs> and so I always have this thing with my TAs, and I say, you know, give me a call if there's something unusual on the exam and so forth. And I get this call like late one night and goes, what the hell is Malcolm? <laughs> so I shouldn't tell them, right? I mean, just leave it as the Hulk, right? Yeah? It's Malcolm in the middle. Malcolm in the middle, yeah. Duh. Other questions? I should have opened this up, should I? Shannon. Um, I'm a little confused about G proteins. Okay. It seems like there's a part of a G protein, and then like there's a difference between a G protein, GTP, and GDP. Okay. And which one is binding where, and I'm sort of really confused. Okay, so the term G protein, uh, to hopefully alleviate your confusion, the term G protein simply means protein binding guanine nucleotides. Okay? Uh -huh. So it can bind GTP, it can bind GDP, right? And that's what we talk about RAS being a G related protein because it also binds GTP or GDP. Well, so what are GDP and GTP? Guanine nucleotides. GTP oh, is. So those, those are nucleotides then? Yeah, yeah. It's, so oh, GTP okay. is like ATP except it has guanine instead of adenine on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yes? Yep. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. How come? So her question is one of the problems in the book. And the problem in the book says that if you take small concentrations of pala and you... Um, treat ATCase with it, you discover that you actually increase the activity of the enzyme. If you use high concentrations of poly, you completely kill the enzyme. The question is why? Her answer is exactly right. So the answer to the question is, in low concentrations, only one or two of the sites get bound, locking the enzyme in the R state, right? locking the enzyme in the R state, and then those, those ones that aren't bound to PALA are just as active as they can be. So that's e exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Can you send an email out about an error someone Oh, I had an error on a, on a sign on the delta G. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you pull the figure up for it? Sure. So um, the, the original one I modified, so there's not even on here anymore, but uh, 
but I, I can show you what, where it was. So it was actually the highlights for, um, it was the one, let's see, is that right? Uh, yeah, it was this one right here. So on the original, when I had written this reaction backwards, so I'd written it, creatine phosphate plus ADP goes to creatine plus ATP. And I left the, the sign as plus, and it should have been negative. Whenever you reverse the direction of a, of a reaction, you have to change the sign. And so I hadn't done that. So I just went back and rewrote it in the same way that you saw it in class, which is the way, this is the way I showed it in class. OK. Other questions? Good questions. You guys feel confident for this one? No? I want to see everybody make an A on this. Ask you again on Friday, okay? Okay, have fun. See you on Friday. What's that? The pet theory over fructose. Oh yeah, my pet have theory. You, have you done like publishing and peer review of it yet, or is it still very early stage? Well, I'm not. I'm not doing research on it, so oh, okay. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any data, which is what I would need to publish. Okay, but, yeah, you. but it's a, I like the idea anyway. So, okay. yep. Okay. When one three. Uh, B BPG uh, to three PG, yeah. uh, we have ATP, right? Yeah. Can I say uh, one one three BPG? One three BPG. One three BPG is not being oxidized. It's already been oxidized. But so no. uh, it produces energy. Produce ATP. ATP contains energy. Can I say this energy? It's not, but just because you're producing ATP doesn't mean it's being oxidized. No, that's not. That's not happening. It's substrate level phosphorylation. Oh. The oxidation happened when you made one three BPG, not when one three BPG goes to something else. So it does always. Uh, not What's that? Not always uh, produce uh, uh, energy be oxidized. Not the always the same time. I'm not when, sure what you're asking. Uh, when you produce energy, it be oxidized. It's not the always the right.